Hello, and welcome to this first module of the Library's Research Skills Programme. My name is Dea Jeannie, I'm a Training Coordinator at the Office of Scholarly Communication. For this video, I've drawn on my own experience of publishing and doing research, but I've also spoken to lots of librarian colleagues and other researchers who have published their work. And I've come up with a list of areas that you should be thinking about when choosing a journal for your research. It will be important for you uh, to think about this for yourself too. So pause the video at this point and make a list of things that you think will be important. Uh, as soon as you've done that, resume the video and we'll see how your list compares to mine. Okay, so how to choose a journal, how to make sure that your research gets published in the best possible outlet. As I said, I'll keep the video quite short and practical. I do want us to start by considering your aims. So are you writing because you want to build humanities knowledge on the subject? Do you want to contribute to the research discourse? Or are you a bit more grounded? Do you want practitioners to apply your findings in the real world, like educators or the medical sector? Or are you thinking about your own career, like securing a postdoc contract or a tenured position? Are you thinking about working in the industry instead? And don't forget that publishing itself can help you improve your research because others will test the value of your arguments, you'll have comments from reviewers and readers, and also you might find new collaborators who've read your research and get in touch. There's also an element of pride. It's lovely to see our work out there in the published and we can share it with colleagues, friends, family. And finally, there might be links to commercial applications that rely on the work being published. So you might have one or more of these aims for your publication, but keep this front and center because they will guide what we talk about over these five areas. The key things to consider are the scope, the prestige of the journal, the time scale, the cost, and possibly the language. Let's look at each one in turn. So scope is really the most important point. Does the journal publish the sort of research that you're doing? Is it the right topic? Um, you'll find this out quite easily either by googling the journal name and then author's guidelines. Um, they usually have quite a detailed page that specifies what sort of articles they're looking for. You should also have a look at previous issues. Are the articles there similar to yours in terms of concepts or methodology? And this doesn't have to be particularly difficult. Think most importantly about what you read, what your supervisor reads. What do you cite in the article that you're writing? That will give you a really good guideline of what sort of journal might be in the right scope. The second consideration is a bit of a thorny issue, and that's prestige. We know that some journals are considered very prestigious, and others have more niche audiences and perhaps smaller audiences. This might be really important for you and for your career, but on the other hand, it doesn't have to be all an end all, and you need to think carefully about how important is the prestige of the journal for you and for your aims? One way that people assess prestige is the journal impact factor. It's one number for each journal, and it's a bit of a quick and dirty way of assessing their success. So it's calculated by taking the number of citations for articles in that journal in a given time period, and divide it by the total number of articles that journal has published. So in essence, that gives us an average number of citations per article in that journal. Um, as far as measuring impact goes, it's okay, but it doesn't take into account, for example, the fact that in biomedical sciences, there are a lot more researchers publishing the more citations, so the journal impact factor tends to be higher. Um, or, for example, journals have been known, not frequently, but occasionally in the past, to gain these metrics and try and boost their impact factor without necessarily improving the quality of the research. And finally, think about articles that are not particularly good and get cited a lot by people who criticise them. Well, those would help the impact factor of the journal, but I'm sure they wouldn't help the prestige. So you should also be thinking about the soundness of the research in that journal. Uh, in your own professional opinion, is it a good journal? Would you be proud to be featured in it? And also, what does your audience read? 
sometimes practitioners read things that don't have a high impact factor but are very relevant to their research. So in that case, if you want to reach them in particular, you might be better off choosing a more niche journal. Another metric that I want to make you aware of, because it might be relevant, particularly for academic careers, uh, is the age index. So it's one number that refers to a researcher, and it tries to measure both how many papers they published and also what was the impact of those papers. In essence, the age number is calculated by taking the number of papers that have been cited each number of times. So if, um, if my age index is three, that means out of my papers, at least three of them have been cited three times or more. Now, let's see how that applies in practice. If you take the first research on the left here, you can see that on the horizontal axis, they've got a number of papers, but not huge. On the vertical axis, you can see that at least some of the papers have received a huge number of citations. Now, the square here, the yellow square, represents the age index. So you can see the number of papers is equal to the number of citations. It's good, but it's not amazing. The second researcher in the middle has published a huge number of papers. Even his most cited ones don't have a huge number of citations. So again, the age index is OK. The third researcher on the right here has maximized both the number of papers and the number of citations per paper. Her age index is considerably bigger. Now, I know that's a holy grail and it can be hard to do, but it's something to consider. So don't put all your eggs in one basket with one very, very important paper. Equally, don't salami slice your research into a huge number of low impact papers. Try to find a healthy balance between the two. Again, the age index is not perfect. Uh, it does reflect the fact that more senior researchers tend to have higher age indexes, even if their research is not necessarily better quality than a more junior researcher, and so on. So be aware of the limitations. There's a whole section on metrics uh, coming up at the end of term, so log in for that if you're interested to find out more. Um, related to that is the question of when is enough? When do you stop collecting data and start writing the paper and getting that published? Well, there are various considerations and it will depend on your research and your specialty. I can only give broad instructions here. Try to think about whether you have a strong argument that can stand alone, whether there are any obvious gaps or assumptions that haven't been tested, which a little bit of extra research, extra experiments might help you to cover. Also, where do you want to publish? If you are aiming for one of those really high impact panels, then it might take a little bit more time to build a wider and stronger argument to accept it. On the other hand, can you press for time? If you're coming to the end of a contract and looking for the next postdoc or position, then you might want to think about getting the article published straight away rather than waiting to accumulate more and more information. Ultimately, this is an area where your supervisor is going to be really helpful in giving you advice, and so will colleagues. So try to discuss this with people who understand your research. One little caveat there, I don't want to give the impression that I'm saying keep collecting data on the same experiment until you get a value that's strongly significant. That is absolutely not what you should be doing. Your sample size should be decided at the start of the experiment, um, probably with a power analysis. And if you keep collecting data until you get the right p-value, then that's actually my practice and not something you should be doing. Now, the third consideration to make is time scale. Journals do differ uh, in how long they take to review and publish articles, and disciplines differ. I mean, in some sciences, it might take days or weeks to get published. In some humanities, it might take years. So be aware of that. But even within a field, try to find out more. Some journals say on their website how long it takes them on average. Sometimes you can email the editor and they'll, they should be able to tell you. Now, if you're in a rush, this is going to be quite important for you and might affect your choice of journal. There's another element, and that's to do with the chance of being rejected. I would suggest that it's usually a good idea to aim high. Go for a journal where you think it might be a bit of a long shot to get accepted. But, um, but if so, it'd be great. However, it does mean that there is a good chance you will be rejected. And that's fine. And you'll still get lots of useful feedback. Um, but it will add to the timeline. 
because forget you can only submit to one journal at a time so if you're in a rush it might be better to go for a safer option a journal where you think you've got a really good chance of being accepted and be out sooner another way to find out how long the peer review will take is to use the website SciRev it's a bit like TripAdvisor for peer review so other researchers who've gone through the peer review process will post information about journals They'll tell you how long it took them for a great rejection, for instance, or first round peer review and final publication. They also put comments on how well um, the editor dealt with them and how they found the whole process. Lots of useful information. And you might also want to add your own thoughts to it to help other researchers. Number four is the cost. We'll talk some more about open access later on in the module, further down the page. For now, let me just say that Open access is a growing movement, so more and more authors choose to make their article free for readers to read. That often means they have to pay either a submission charge before peer review or an article processing charge once the article is accepted. These are not cheap. They can range from a few hundred pounds to thousands of pounds, so it shouldn't come out of your pocket, but talk to your supervisor and see whether there's a grant that you can apply for or whether they're already budgeted for. You would also need to consider color charges and page charges. Some journals will, for instance, charge extra for graphs in color. Perhaps you can make your graph work in black and white or for extra words. Perhaps writing more concisely will help not only your style, but also your pocket. Um, one thing to note is that if your funder requires that you publish with open access, it might be possible to receive funding from them through the Office of Scholarly Communication. We'll let you know about that once you submit your article on openaccess.com.ac.uk, which you should be doing as soon as you're accepted anyway. And if you are required to public an article processing charge, it's good to know that you're getting value for money. So the Quality Open Access Market is another website where authors can input their feedback on journals, scale of one to five, and on different areas such as um, editors' emails and timeline, so again, that's somewhere where you can find information about where, what journals are offering you in exchange for that article processing charge. The final consideration is language. I know this might not apply to all disciplines. Sometimes English is the only way to go. But in some cases, you might want to think about writing in other languages. For instance, if your target audience is more comfortable in different languages, or if your research is very geographically centered and you want the people in that area to be able to read it. But think about whether that's something you can do, whether you need help from a native speaker to polish your language, whether the right sort of journals are available in the language that you choose. It's something to think about. Ultimately, I want you to really keep your eyes in sight when you're thinking about all this. We thought about these at the very beginning of the video, and they should guide your choice of journal. You shouldn't be doing things just because everyone else is doing them or because it's fashionable or because one academic has their favorite journal. Think carefully about what you're trying to achieve and what is the best way of achieving that aim. Now, that's the end of this video. I hope you found it helpful to think about what you need to consider when choosing a journal. I will see you again later on when we talk about peer review. And I hope you like the rest of this module and that you'll join us again in future weeks for other modules. All right. Goodbye. Thanks.